19 will experience mild to moderate symptoms and recover without special treatment. According to the Ghana Health Service, 91% of persons infected with coronavirus in the country do not develop signs and symptoms. When we say someone is, uh, has recovered, there are two tests that have been done, symptoms gone and then also negative test for the RT-PCR. Now, when the RT-PCR comes out as negative, it does not necessarily mean that you have no virus in there, but it's actually saying that the viral level is very low, very, very low, so that this person does not pose threats to the general public. They cannot infect other people. The World Health Organization website indicates that virus can be cleared totally. However, more research are ongoing to confirm this. It is also believed that even after symptoms disappear, there may be small amount of virus in the patient system and that it is suspected that some of the organs in the body may be damaged. When you have a viral infection, which is here, let's talk about the SARS-CoV-2, when it gets into the lungs, it can um, it, it interact or it hijacks the cells of the some of the cells of the lungs. Um, here we're talking about the pneumocyte too. So if these um, cells are hijacked, they may be destroyed if their body is not able to fight it. If the cells are not able to fight the virus off, the virus will succeed in destroying the cells. So the destruction of these cells can damage the lungs. Um, however, some people can recover and they will um, repair the damages that have been caused. Globally, 5,618,829 people have contracted COVID-19. Ghana's COVID-19 case count has risen to 7,117 cases with 2,317 persons recovering from the disease as at May 27. There have been calls by a section of Guineans to ease restrictions on public gathering. Though the president is yet to make any announcements to that effect, persons close to government have been given subtle leads of a possible easing of these restrictions. William Evans Incum has been engaging the clergy to ascertain the readiness of the church. He joins us live from Kumasi. CCC for him to tell us what arrangement they have made in order to ensure as far as COVID-19 is concerned. So you want to say you command one of the largest congregation sites in the in the Ashanti as far as your church is concerned. We're looking at over 3,000 members in your church. We seem to be having some challenge with that, but we will establish contact with William again because he is uh, testing the mood um, or, you know, assessing if the church is ready, for instance, if restrictions are lifted. There have been calls by a section of Ghanaians to ease restrictions on public gathering. Now, though the president is yet to make any announcements to that effect, persons close to government have been giving subtle leads of a possible easing of these restrictions. Our man Williams Evans Incum has been engaging uh, the clergy to ascertain the readiness of the church. He joins us from Kumasi live to bring us some feed. We'll get, we'll get back to that story later. But government has launched a 6.8 million CD postgraduate scholarship training in specialized medical areas. More than 900 physicians are expected to benefit from the program to be rolled out by the scholarship secretariat. The 918 physicians drawn from the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons are to undertake specialized training to manage critical diseases such as the coronavirus. The 6.8 million cities is to be disbursed through the scholarship secretariat. 
The intervention forms part of government determination to improve healthcare delivery in achieving the SDGs by 2030. The Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons has produced more than 1,000 specialized physicians and surgeons as at the end of 2019. The Vice President, Dr. Muhammad Baumia, who launched the program, charged beneficiaries to exhibit a higher sense of commitment in their training. The government stands ready to play its part, even with all the fiscal challenges now imposed on us by COVID-19 challenges. Uh, we have to save lives and that, that there's no cost <laughs> that you can put or price that you can put on a human life and the COVID has taught us all that it is important to make those investments even though they may be very expensive but you are making those investments for the future of this country. The health minister Kwekwa Jumamenu cautioned against undermining the training of staff in the sector. Konfanochi sponsors a young lady doctor comes to the college to specialize. She wants to go to a lower facility in the district to serve there. Kofanochi says that you have to pay the, for the bond before we allow you to go. So even when willingly, some of the young people want to leave the tertiary facilities to go to the district to serve, not until we find a way to pay the money they spent on her or, he, or him, they can leave. The Registrar of the Scholarship Secretariat, Kinsla Jemaim, recommended a collaboration with the college to finance most of their skill development programs. The leadership of the Scholarship Secretariat appreciated the challenges faced by the, colleges of, the, college of, the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons and gave assurance to extend the needed support as required, reiterating the fact that it aligns with the government desire for our dear nation to, to attain Agenda 2030. Registrar of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, Dr. Henry Lawson, lauded the support for the institution. Now let's revisit our earlier story where there have been calls by a section of Ghanaians to ease restrictions on public gathering. Though the president is yet to make any announcement that affects persons close to government have been given subtle leads of a positive easing of, of these restrictions. William Evans Inkum has been engaging the clergy to ascertain the readiness of the church. He joins us live from Kumasi. Of the church. For him to run us through the, 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 the measures that they have put in place in order to ensure social distancing protocol as far as this particular um, church is concerned. So, Pastor Ransford Oben is the head pastor of the CCC. Now, you are leading uh, about 3,000 members. As far as you Should the government or the president come out and say that he has eased restriction on social gathering and all of that, how are you going to manage the crowd? Um, in fact, under normal the church can take 3,000. But because of the COVID, we have arranged the chairs with the required distance, two meters, and so we can only take 400 at a sitting. And because of that, I've already informed our members. We have texted them, we have called them and told them. And we've told them that we are going to have six services uh, every weekend. We we'll have two services in the morning, uh, on Saturday, and then on Sunday, we are going to have four services. And every service will be one hour. We are not going to have things as usual, so the services will not be prolonged. At the same time, we have also said we cannot do children's service because uh, children cannot observe. So initial stages, we cannot do children's service. Children may stay at the house. So parent, the husband can come to the first service and go home, take care of the children. And the mother can come to the second service or the third service. No. Arrangement in the auditorium, fantastic. Because I can say that there's no file, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, you've numbered the chairs. Just, I just want to believe that it's for easy identification and all of that. Now, let's look at the entry points or the exit points. I think that's where the problem is. When you close from church, I mean, a lot of people don't want to get out. Are you going to ensure that they don't go as in crowd, but they go in batches? Um, it, it's not going to be a problem uh, because we have enough doors and big doors and uh, already the number has been reduced. But at the same time, every service before we close, I will announce to them that please 
we will go, the ushers will direct them how they will go out. Maybe the first, uh, you go out, the second and the third. So there will be a lot of education. And, uh, and as we continue to do that, they will be used to it. Yeah, my fine, very final question to you. You have done church but we also know that in other places even when we were in the partial lockdown there was blatant i mean flout of um, the directive by the president i'm talking about other i mean uh, uh, your colleague pastors some of your colleague pastors how what advice will you give to the president to also ensure that at least there is strong monitoring team to ensure that people are doing the right thing yes my advice is that the churches should be re monitor the churches that every church that says that is ready they shouldn't take them by mouth they should go to the church premises look at the way they've arrived take this number of people at a time and so that if they flood the instructions they can close it at any time one of the things that you see here we have the machines to make sure that at after every service we will fumigate all the place and make the place safe we have got our uh, temperature check we've got uh, the ushers and all the people that will be standing there we've got protect and we have bar services and so we had we have made sure that we make sure that everybody get a nose um, we get masks and when you enter into the car, it's compulsory. So they will have one. If you don't have one, they will give you one. So all these things have been laid in place. And I want Ghanaians to know that the church is a safer place to come and worship God than to go to the market. All right. Absolutely. All right. So, um, Stephen, that is it. So, I mean, everything is in place as far as this particular place is concerned. But the big question is, are we going to see similar scenes when we... Uh, go to other churches when the restriction on social gathering and all of that is eased. Without Evans income, TV3 News. All right, so that should give you an idea um, of what church will be looking like after or if the restrictions are lifted. The Coalition of NGOs in Health has re echoed its call for the establishment of a national control program on coronavirus. A statement issued by the coalition says it's time to modify the current guidelines and intensify implementation of plans to control the virus in Ghana. While expressing appreciation so far for the ongoing COVID-19 response and containment measures, the coalition says there is greater need for the establishment of the National Control Program on Coronavirus. Let's speak with the National President of the Coalition of NGOs in Health, Dr. Gabriel Benako. Hello, Doc. We're still staying with issues of COVID-19, where the Coalition of NGOs in Health has re-echoed its call for the establishment of a national control program on coronavirus. A statement issued by the Coalition says it's time to modify the current guidelines and intensify implementation of plans to control the virus in Ghana. While expressing appreciation so far for the ongoing COVID-19 response and containment measures, the coalition says there is greater need for the establishment of the National Control Program on Coronavirus. Now, away from health-related issues, the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, Ghana Battalion 86, GANBAT 86, has held a medal presentation parade to decorate personnel with the United Nations Peace Medal in recognition of their contribution towards peace and stability in South Lebanon. The parade took place on Friday, May 29, 2020, at the Combat Headquarters. The same day, the International Day of the Peacekeeper was commemorated. 
Now, the Sector West Commander, Brigadier General Diego Filippo Falco, who was the guest of honor, commanded the battalion and the commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Abbas Atuluk, Atul for uh, their commitment to peace operations with diligence and high professionalism amidst the coronavirus pandemic. The sector commander paid tribute to all peacekeepers who have paid the ultimate price in bringing peace to the world, especially warrant officer class um, Aqua Patrick, class one Aka Patrick of the combat, who passed on a month earlier, earlier while serving with Unifil. The ceremony was uniquely organized with less pageantry and under strict social distancing and other preventive protocols in order to prevent the spread of the novel coronavirus. Now, joining us on Skype is Captain Nathaniel Asamoah. Um, he is a public information officer of Unifil Combat 86. Happy International Peacekeepers Day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So how significant is this day? Okay, so when we deploy a mission, um, the ultimate, all the efforts we put in here to bring peace to any location is the award of the Human Medal, which I have on my chest. And so this is what we are given uh, as a recognition for our efforts here. And so it's the biggest day for any peacekeeper. And today being International Day of Peacekeepers, it is just fitting that we, as a Ghanaian battalion, had our medal day today. And so it's an exciting day for us, and we are very happy and feel proud to be wearing these medals that signify our efforts for peace in South Lebanon. And that's great. And congratulations for uh, your badge as well. Coronavirus Thank seems you. to be battling every part of the world now. What role does, you know, the troops play um, in helping to fight this pandemic? So for, uh, we have non-contact operations and contact operations. So we here are responsible for monitoring uh, the blue line. This is the line of withdrawal of Israel from Lebanon. It is not a border and is depicted by blue barrels. And we are uh, responsible for monitoring that. For that job and patrolling within the communities in vehicles, it hasn't affected it in any way. But when it comes to our humanitarian efforts within the communities, where we have to go into the communities, for training sessions with the people in the communities, for uh, friendly games, for uh, teach English in the schools. These uh, operations have been uh, in a way hampered for the, uh, for the time being due to coronavirus. So we are not able to go into the communities to um, do this. If we have to go within, within the communities, then we have to get our PPEs on, we um, have the social distance and we observe it. and. And we only go out when it's really essential for such things. If it's not essential, then we do not do that. But when it comes to the general operations we have here, those were mostly non-contact, so those have not been impacted in any way. But obviously, as you mentioned in your report, the parade was um, whittled down in terms of the pageantry. We didn't do it as big as we, we normally do it. We had to scale it down. We had to observe the social distancing, even on the parade square. Among the troops that were marching, there was large gaps within them. And then if you can see from the pictures uh, or the images, you see that everybody had their face mask. So, yes, that's how uh, it's kind of impacted on our operations here. Mm. Right. Thank you very much for joining us. Once again, congratulations on your contribution to maintaining peace around the world. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with uh, Captain Nathaniel Asamoah. He is the Public Information Officer of Unifil Combat 86. Today is International Peacekeepers Day. Still watching Midday Live. Now, the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon Unifil Ghana Battalion 86 has held a medal presentation parade to decorate personnel with the United Nations Peace Medal in recognition of their contribution towards peace and stability in South Lebanon. Now, the parade took place on Friday, May 29, 2020, at the combat headquarters. The same day, the International Day of the Peacekeeper was commemorated. The Sector West Commander, Brigadier General Diego Filippo Falco, who was the guest of honor, commanded the battalion and their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Abbas Atuluk, for, for their to look for their commitment to the peace operations with diligence and high professionalism amidst the coronavirus pandemic. The sector commander paid tribute to all peacekeepers who have paid the ultimate price 
in bringing peace to the world, especially warrant officer. But away from the management of University of Health and Allied Sciences is appealing to governments to rehabilitate the school's road network to befit its status as a public university. No single stretch of road at the university campus is tarred. Robert Abilbus reports. The University of Health and Allied Sciences, the first public health university in the Volta region, was established by an Act of Parliament. It is the first public university in the Volta region and the only state university wholly dedicated to the training of healthcare professionals in the country. The university currently runs 17 undergraduate programs in six schools, five postgraduate programs, and two institutes. The main campus at Soko de Loco has only one school with administration structure completed. The 17.3 kilometer road network started by USS UA Ghana Limited construction has been abandoned. The contractor allegedly abandoned the work eight years ago and left with only 15% of work done. Vice Chancellor Professor John Obusi Japon described the current state of the road as terrible. I wonder whether there is any university in the whole wide world with such roads. All attempts to get the road face has not yielded the expected results. Professor Obusi Japon disclosed that for the past four years, management has been trying to reaward the contract. So the current roads minister has promised that he's going to intervene. Indeed, two years ago when we were visited by His Excellency the President, he directed that this should be a priority. And the roads minister promised that he was going to uh, help us with this. Well, I believe he's having some challenges, but we really need the intervention uh, now. The situation is worse off, particularly in this era of COVID-19 pandemic, as the university has been selected as a testing center, which certainly attracts vehicles carrying samples every day to the university. Some of the drivers who carry COVID-19 samples from Hohoi, Pando, Dambai, Krachi, Inkwanta, and Jasikan to the center share their frustration about the road network. It's very bad. Sometimes they carry, they carry out the bus open by itself because of the road. Now, President Donald Trump's tweet from his profile suggesting it violates rules, and this is reference um, to the Twitter um, rant that's going on now, but Twitter has replaced that tweet with a warning, and that can be viewed by clicking on it. It is the latest in an escalating role between Twitter and the White House. But Mr. Trump was tweeting about protests in the U.S. city of Minneapolis following protest over the death of a black man in police custody. The president said he would send in the National Guard and follow that up with a warning that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Pakistan Yassar is my colleague and joins me via Skype from the U.S., to share some light on this. Well, that's a rather interesting occurrence there, but Pakwesi Asar is my colleague and joins me via Skype from the US. Pakwesi, thanks for joining us. So what is the level of apprehension that this um, tweeter back and forth with Trump has caused? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. So um, it's been one of outrage and disdain. And if you monitor Twitter and the responses that have come in after Donald Trump's uh, tweets, um, was it yesterday? There's, there's been widespread condemnation uh, by Americans who think that it's uh, a way of glorifying uh, retaliation on uh, protesters by the police. Um, as you may be aware, uh, Twitter has already uh, flagged that comment. They've placed a public interest notice and say it violates their rules regarding uh, glorifying violence. Uh, already there's been uh, a back and forth between Twitter and Donald Trump uh, over the last few weeks. 
because, as you may be aware, um, Twitter had played some fact-checking labels on a couple of things that Donald Trump had said, and he had also uh, subsequently threatened to issue an executive order which will punish uh, the social media giant uh, for what he says are, are the attempts to police people's comments. So this only goes to heighten the, the tension and the, 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 the pressure between uh, Twitter and Donald Trump. Right, and uh, all throughout the week there has been protest, uh, obviously because of George Floyd's issue. Has this made things worse? Are you seeing more protests in, in, in the U.S. now? Well, Miriam, as I earlier mentioned, uh, this particular action on Monday, the action leading to the killing of the 46-year-old uh, uh, Minnesota uh, gentleman has, has caused a lot of outrage and disdain among the black community, uh, leading to widespread demonstrations over the, uh, you know, the two couple of days. Uh, we know that there's been demonstrations uh, that have occurred in Minneapolis and other parts of the country, uh, which have led to uh, violence, uh, destruction of properties, uh, police uh, stations, and what have you. Uh, we know, for instance, that on Saturday, uh, there's, there's likely to... On Saturday, there's likely uh, to be a rally held um, in uh, somewhere Nashville, uh, which has uh, been dubbed the I Will Breathe rally against police brutalities and white supremacy. So um, it appears that um, the people will stop at nothing uh, to have justice served. Uh, as you may have monitored Donald, Donald Trump's earlier tweet, uh, his very first tweet after this brutality was meted out, he said he was going to ensure, he's already asked the FBI to uh, institute investigations into the matter, and he will ensure that justice is served. So, that appears to be the posture of a lot of people in America today. They want justice served, and they want it served immediately. Mm. And, and amongst the black, when you, when you do have conversations with them, do you get the sense that they feel unsafe, and for that reason they would want to take, for instance, take security matters into their own hands? Do you, do you, do you get that sentiment? Absolutely, Miriam. Um, I, I monitored um, a statement by uh, the likely uh, presidential candidate for the Democratic Party, Joe Biden, who said the nation will only heal if such issues of white supremacy and police brutality uh, meted out against uh, black people and minorities are addressed. And he su suggested, for instance, that there appears to be some kind of apprehension and fear amongst black Americans, and justifiably so. Uh, they feel that there appears to be some discrimination when it comes to uh, police handling of uh, issues. Um, clearly, uh, we've, we've, we've recorded a number of deaths involving black Americans, uh, involving minority groups in the United States. And when you look at the same instance when it comes to uh, white people, there appears to be some kind of a, a difference. And so people are worried that the cases are getting one too many. They want the issues addressed as, as early as possible. And until that is done, people will have to take their own uh, personal security uh, quite seriously. I, I've been speaking to a number of people uh, since this issue broke out, uh, have a couple of friends in other states in America. And it appears people don't feel safe, they, they don't feel protected enough, and, and they feel that a lot has to be done. And that's why you're seeing a lot of pressure being mounted on the federal government. Uh, we know that um, black American uh, musicians, celebrities have added their voice to, to what's happening. We know the church has also added its voice. There's a lot of pressure being mounted on the federal government to ensure that something is done and is done as early as possible, Miriam. Absolutely. And you are, you are a black student, obviously, in the U.S. Um, how are your lecturers reacting to, 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 to what's happening? It's, it's not any different from how other minority groups are reacting to, to what's happening. Um, but again, you know, you also have to be careful how you uh, voice out your fears and frustrations. People are generally keeping to themselves and, you know, feeling more comfortable amongst their secular group of people. And it's, it's fair to say that it is not a widespread view amongst even the white people. There are, there are a number of white people who feel outraged and disgusted about what, what appears to be happening. The, the fact that there's some kind of discrimination uh, against black people. And so 
Um, people want to see an end to this uh, as early as possible. As you may be aware, even during the demonstrations, which led to destruction of uh, property and some police as, uh, you know, facilities, um, a CNN reporter, a journalist, was also arrested uh, only yesterday. We know the CNN has issued a statement, uh, you know, condemning the arrest and saying that it is against, it's a violation uh, on the First Amendment. So, you know, we're just hoping that things will normalize and normalize as soon as possible. Right, Pakwesi, thank you so, so much um, for sharing some light on this. Pakwesi Asare is our colleague from uh, in the United States at the moment, giving us some update on what's happening with Donald Trump and Twitter. There's more news on Midday Live in just a few. Stay with us. Let's do some business now. Director of Business Operations at Dalex Finance, Joe Jackson, has said the fight against corruption is being derailed by partisanship. He was reacting to an auctioneer's assertion that Alfred Williams' property on sale after a court order is not being purchased for fear of the property being reversed in the future by a different government. The properties are being sold by this order of the Supreme Court. Nobody should be afraid of buying them. But then we know what has happened in times past and the kind of pronouncements that come from our political parties. So the perception is that I don't know and I don't want to take that risk. It's really, I don't want the political risk of buying property for which has become a partisan political issue. That is a sad, sad reflection of where our country is at the moment. On June 27, 2019, the Supreme Court ordered the sale of assets of Alfred Woyume to defray the 47.2 million cities debt he owes the state. The auctioneer wrote to the Minister for National Security on February 7, 2020, informing him potential buyers are cautious to buy and think there is a probability of a takeover in future. On March 4, Minister for National Security, Albert Kandapa, wrote to the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice that the Woyome property be surrounded to the state. What has truly happened is that the rabid political partisanship that we've displayed in all spheres of our political life have now resulted in that the fight against corruption is being is now being held hostage to the partisanship. Our political parties, both sides of the divide, have become so partisan that no, everybody is afraid that if a decision is taken during the regime, A, when B comes to power, B will reverse it despite the political cost and the economic cost of doing so. Is this perception and fear of possible takeover likely to impact investment? Uh, the Supreme Court has mandated that somebody's property should be sold. That is a very important issue. The real concern for us is that in this fight, for example, where now we are getting to clean up the financial sector and where people are in court, will the decisions that are taken into court, if they have to be implemented, will they also be perceived as being hostage to the partisanship? That time will tell. But I don't think that it will have any immediate impact on investments, either local or foreign. That's it for business. Yao Fosulabi is up next with sports. Let's start with music and reggae. Now, renowned reggae musician Anthony B has called for a collaboration between dancehall artist Shatawale and Stoneboy. He says there's nothing wrong with young musicians competing, but not in a manner that could lead to violence. He spoke to Black Hobby on 3FM 92.7. Anthony B known in real life as Keith Blair, is of the view music should not divide people. The legendary reggae artist said even though he does not live in Africa, he is disappointed about stories on social media about Shatawale and Stoneboy being violent just as Mavado and Vibes Cartel. He admonished young musicians to be role models. 
I was checking out the social media and I realized that Shatawali and Stoneboy was going at it like a vibe cartel or a mobile. I started to put out a little message that no, sir, we don't need that. That's not the side of the music. We all have to we have to live together because we are the role models that the youths in the ghetto trying to be like, trying to emulate. And once you become popular, even if you never see yourself as a role model, you have to know that once you become popular, you start to inspire and influence youths. So you have to take that now as a responsibility. He said it'll feel good if Shatawali and Stoneboy collaborate on his song and perform it together, but should not be forced to do so. When I look at both of them platform, just the other day I see two of them riding bikes together, yeah, man. doing things together. So I'm an entertainer. Right. So I know when entertainers come together, you understand? And sometimes we can't force that energy, you know. But yeah. Some reggae for the Friday. Have a great weekend. That's it for Midday Live. I'm Miriam Osei Edmund. Thank you for your time.